write things like this. F being Q is conjugate to, to, the, to the model. So surgery is about constructing the model, which is realizable, of course. So you need to, to know which models are realizable as homomorphic maps and which ones are not. So the question is, if I give you a quasi regular map, when or how can I know when is really a dynamical model for a holomorphic one? Okay, so when is it realizable? And the answer, so equivalently, when we have a holomorphic map that is quasi conformally conjugate to the original one? And the answer comes from the measurable Riemann mapping theorem. Really, the, the answer is this will exist as long as you can find an almost complex structure which is invariant under your quasi-regular map. Okay? If you can do that, then you will find a holomorphic solution of this problem. How? Well, what does it mean that sigma is invariant? It means that your quasi-regular map transports it to itself as a field of ellipses. Since this has bounded dilatation, you can integrate, you can use the measurable Riemann mapping theorem to find phi which transports it to the standard complex structure. You apply this phi on the both sides, and then this composition defined like this, right, like doing first phi minus one, f and phi, what happens is that it is quasi-conformal because it's the composition, it's quasi-regular, excuse me, because it's the composition of quasi-regular maps, one quasi-regular and two quasi-conformal. And on top, it preserves the standard complex structure, or what's the same, the derivative with respect to z bar is zero, the mu is zero, almost everywhere. So by Wiles lemma, this is actually a holomorphic map. Okay? So the composition, will be holomorphic as long as you are able to integrate and as long as you have the same structure on both sides. So if you are able to build your model and you are able to find this field of ellipses or this complex structure or this measurable function which preserves, which is preserved under the pull bar, then you are in good shape. Well, let me make a parenthesis. So, so this is one type of surgery. Sometimes, actually, one can start already with a holomorphic map and simply change the complex structure. So instead of building, pasting, and cutting, no, you could start with a map, change your complex structure, and make the same question, right? If you change it in a way that it's F invariant still, then when you conjugate, you will obtain a new holomorphic map conjugated to the original one. This is what's called a deformation of your map. Okay? So you've kept the original and you've built a new holomorphic map which comes from the other by the quasi conformal conjugacy. In some cases, you do this over and over and you keep getting, in fact, you, can, you, and you get always the same map you started with. This is what's called rigidity. Okay, so a map is quasi-conformally rigid. If no matter which deformation you do, you always end up in the same place. And let me give you an example. So if I look at the centers of hyperbolic components of the Mandelbrot set, so points for, um, well, or not only the Mandelbrot set, but so if you, if you take this picture here comes from looking at the one fifth limb, so it's, let me make a zoom. So here is the limb, there is one point special in the center, which is d squared plus c, for which there is a point period five orbit, which is super attractive, okay? So uh, that point is rigid, that polynomial is rigid, so no matter how you change the complex structure, you will always end up with z squared plus c zero. But instead, if you take two C values in the, in the hyperbolic component, all of them actually, any two C values in this hyperbolic component are quasi-conformally conjugate. They come from making this type of deformations, and in fact, this type of deformations was almost a 
the first instance of surgery that was ever done. And it allows you to parameterize the component and to do a lot of things. So surgery gives you constructions which afterwards have a lot of consequences to prove things, allow you to prove many theorems in, in dynamics. Okay, so by doing this type of soft surgery, you can see how your holomorphic map, how your polynomial moves uh, as you move the parameter in the same hyperbolic component. Now, I will not go, go into this, but um, I'm not sorry. <laughs> yes, I will go into this. So let me give you an example. So now we are ready to look at the first example. The first example will not be about soft surgery. We will not talk about this today because we cannot talk about everything. And the first example I will do is about uh, cut and paste surgery, the simplest one that one can think, or at least the one I think is the simplest. And this is the straightening theorem. This was due to, to a Lee and Hubbard in 85. And it explains why, in the middle of nowhere, well, Newton's method is not nowhere, huh? but uh, in the middle of a, of a dynamical planes of who knows what, right, whatever, transcendental maps or rational maps or whatever, suddenly you find these things that are, are exactly equal to the Julian set of quadratic polynomials or cubic or polynomials in general, right? So why do you find this here? How, how do you explain this? And this is uh, the instance of surgery that I want to explain to you. So this is Newton's method of a cubic polynomial, but I could show you another one. So this is a transcendental function. Okay. This is, oof, it's a, it's a, it doesn't matter. It's a transcendental function. You can distinguish them by these hairs or canton hairs that you see all around. It's an entire mapping. Uh, and, and, and even if it's an entire mapping of infinite degree, etc., etc., very complicated, in the middle you find in fact, a dead set of rabbits. It's full of rabbits, okay, in this case. So why? Why is this happening? Well, the theorem says the following. It says this will happen every time that locally you can find a set U prime, a topological disk U prime, compactly contained into a bigger one, and you map locally, so on this set, maps d to 1 to the outer one. Okay, so if you have this proper holomorphic map from a set to something that compactly contains it, then inside here you will find, um, this is wrong. Is it right or is it wrong? Uh, wait a second. It's right. It's right. Sorry. Okay. So, so um, you will see that in this set, every behaves it, so locally on this u prime, f behaves exactly as a polynomial. So you will find a polynomial of degree d, this degree here, which is quasi conformally conjugate to p to f on this set. In particular, this tells you that you will find there a copy of the Julian set of the polynomial. If you, com if you define it in the correct way, okay? If you consider uh, orbits escaped in the moment that they leave U prime. So that red thing that I showed you were only those orbits that would leave U at some point, okay? Then they may come back. I give them by scale. Okay, so how do you prove this? So this is the first instance of surgery that I'm showing. So. Uh, this is what I was saying. In particular, there is a quasi conformal homeomorphism between what's called the small Julia set of F and the field Julia set of the polynomial. This is exactly what I was saying. The small Julia set being those orbits that exit U at any time, uh, that don't exit U ever, sorry, the complement of the ones that they were. Okay, so this would be the rabbit in the polynomial, and this would be what you would see in the strange dynamical plane. So how do you prove this? Okay, you do it in the following way. So here is your setting, here is your F, 
And now we are going to define a new map. We only have a local map and we are going to make it global. Okay? So we want to kind of make a model that is a polynomial. Right? We are looking for a polynomial, so we want to fill in what's left with what we think it should be a how it should it should behave like a polynomial. So to do that, we will move to the to this other plane temporarily in the following sense. So first of all, we will map the outside of U with a Riemann map to the outside of a circle of radius R to the D for a certain R. Okay, a big, a big R or a, at least bigger than one. That's conformal. And by the way, we can assume that these boundaries are nice because these boundaries are movable. We could get, get a nice one close to the boundary of U and then the pre-image would also be regular enough so that we know that this Riemann map extends nicely to the boundary. Okay? So we define this Riemann map outside, and now we define phi, a, a map on this inner boundary, right, which kind of agrees with this other, in the sense that if I map by f, and then I go by the Riemann map, and then I take a square root in somehow a continuous way, and I go back, this matches up. So the image of this point will be the one I land with that. So in other words, that this functional equation is satisfied. So f is going by phi, then applied with z to the d, and then phi minus 1. So this, now I have a map on the, on the outer boundary of the annulus and on the inner boundary of the annulus, and I fill in the rest. We'll see that this is an important thing in surgery to know how to do this extension or, or, or filling parts. This is nothing to do with dynamics again. Just I have boundary values and I want to fill it in quasi-conformally. Actually here I can fill it, in, fill it in C1 and since it's a compact set I can do it. Um, it's it's quasi-conformal. This would be like some linear interpolation or whatever. We'll not get into this but you can do, the, you can do this uh, mapping then this closure to the blue closure here, okay? And now we are ready to define the new map, our model. And the model will do the following. We will leave f as it was in u prime. We don't touch that. On the annulus, what we do is that we go by this phi that we've manufactured, then we go by z to the d, because remember, polynomials behave like z to the d outside. So this is what we want to glue on the remaining part of the dynamical plane. So we go by phi, we go by z to the d, and then we come back by the Riemann map. That will give us the image of any z in the annulus. And outside, even easier, this is invisible. No. Outside, I go by the Riemann map, I go by z to the d, and I go back. So somehow what I've done is to glue z to the d. This, is, this phi, together with the Riemann map, is the gluing map. Right? The one that sews z to the d on the outside of u prime. So I sew z with this thread. I sew z to the d on the outer part of u prime. Okay, and this is my new map g, which is quasi regular because it's holomorphic in u prime, it's holomorphic outside u and quasi conformal here. It's continuous everywhere, right? So this is. Uh, quasi regular. Not only is quasi regular, but we can put uh, an invariant complex structure. How? Well, we put circles or sigma zero or, or mu equal zero outside here, where, where you see it, and we make a first pullback under the Riemann map and the phi. What's going to happen since R is holomorphic? The circles will go back to circles, so the standard structure will be preserved. Instead, the ellipses on the annulus will be distorted by a limited amount, the k, the quasi-conformality constant of the gluing map. And that gives me a first pullback, which is invariant, by the way, okay? because when I look at the image, so if I, if I um, what do I want to do? I want to see that f transports this ellipse to this circle, right? So if I take this ellipse and I map by phi and 
and then I map by R, indeed, these pullbacks which can be looked at from the composition, from the definition of the map, just doing it in the opposite direction, we'll see, you will see that the F, the F transports these ellipses into the, the circles of their images, in the image points. Okay, and once I have that, then I spread by the dynamics, which is this formula over here. It just says, it's recursive, huh? be careful. So it just says that now you will do the rest just by the holomorphic map F. In other words, I will take a point in here. I will see if it takes n iterates to fall into here. I will then pull back n times by F until I get an ellipse in this point. If it never falls there, no problem. I put a circle and I forget about it. Observe that this is highly discontinuous. Huh? So in the field Julia set, for example, I will have always circle, but in the moment that I cross the boundary, I have ellipses, okay? So this is discontinuous, but it's unmeasurable. It's, it's because I spread by the dynamics, I don't have to worry about the dilatation because the pullbacks are all done by holomorphic maps. So the dilatation remains bounded, the sigma is invariant, so everything is good. It means that I can apply the measurable Riemann mapping and obtain a map. Now, this is what the surgery gives you, and in any case, when you do that, you have to wonder where you landed, right? So what have I obtained here? Okay, in some cases it's very easy, like here, and in some cases it's very difficult, and in some cases you have no idea, okay? So in this case, this map is holomorphic that we know always. Uh, in fact, it's entire, so it's holomorphic in the whole place, plane, and infinity is a super attractive fixed point. Why? Because look what, you, we, what we glue. We have glued z to the d, and z to the d indeed has infinity as a, as a super attracting fixed point, and also basically on this basin, so outside of you, everything is holomorphic. So the derivative will preserve, the dynamics preserve, everything is, uh, infinity is a critical point exactly the same here that here. So infinity is a super attractive fixed point, so P is a polynomial of degree D, and it is quasi-conformally quadruic to your original map. On you, because the rest you've glued artificially, but at least locally, okay, the polynomial is quasi-conformally quadruic. Um, this on top, observe that in the interior of the field Julian said, if there is any, right, you've done nothing, because we've put the complex, the standard complex structure there, because those were points that were never iterated into the bad region. This means that your, your integrating map, your quasi-conformal map, will be actually conformal on the interior of the field Julia set, if there is any. So for example, if you had, uh, if, the polynom if, um, if the polynomial had a super, uh, Tracking fixed point of a certain multiplier, the same will happen for your polynomial like map and vice versa. And keeping the multiplier on top. This is the one that I'm not going to get into, just to tell you that you can do this with, um, with parameters also. Uh, this, is, uh, this is much more complicated because you have to deal with the continuity of these integrating maps in, in, in many uh, situations, but just let me tell you that in the same way that you find uh, Julia sets in the dynamical planes of other types of maps that are not polynomials, you also find Mandelbrot sets or bifurcation loci of other uh, fa polynomial families in the parameter spaces. Okay, okay so um, I should. Boxes, but they help you to reflect on what is it that you've done or what is it that has been 
important in your construction. Okay? So these, some of them are called Shishigura principles because uh, Shishigura, who is one of the clearly the protagonists of, any of many surgery procedures, try to formalize them in this way, right? To make sure that, uh, or to be able to test that uh, the constructions that he was doing were okay. So for example, the Shishigura principle that is best known is this one, and it just says that, basically it just says that if the region where your model map is quasi-conformal, is a region that you step only from time to time, but you don't come recurrently to it, right? Then you are okay. So this thing that we've seen here, this, this map F that we've defined, right? Basically, is holomorphic here, holomorphic out here, and simply quasi conformal only on these annulus. But this annulus is a, a solo tierra de paso, no? It's, a, <laughs> it's like a, if you ever step on it, you are gone after one iteration and never come back, right? So if, if that is the situation, then you are fine. You will always have an invariant complex structure that you can put and you can. And not only once, I mean, you can actually do more, you could say, if the region where your model map is quasi-conformal is only, if you cannot, if you only go there a finite number of times, you are fine. You still can always find the quasi-conformal. So if you are only interested to know if your model is realizable or not, you could check this condition and forget about the rest, okay? Of course, by doing it, Precisely, you get more information. But if your only question is if this is realizable, this would be enough. Okay? And how would you do that? So, basically, the procedure that we've just done, you would con construct an invariant normal structure defining sigma, sigma zero on the image of this cell and then spreading by the dynamics. We will not be too precise, but even in, that, in abstract, you can construct this invariant, almost complex structure with no problem. So that as long as the forbidden region or the quasi-conformal region is stepped only a finite number of times, you are fine. And this second one illustrates a, or gives rise to the next example that I'm going to do here. So the, the, another one of Shikura's principles says the following. It's another one of these abstract situations where you can be sure that everything works. So it says the following. Um, it says, suppose that you have a function that is holomorphic, that's your model. Huh? You have it holomorphic everywhere except on a set. And on this set, what you do is the following. You, you, you define a map here which is going by a quasi conformal map going by a holomorphic map that leaves this image invariant. Okay, so H is holomorphic. This is, think of it in another plane, different from this. Okay, so this is my gluing map. I glue a map in here, going by phi, then going by u prime, and then going by phi minus one. Okay? If you do this, okay, so if, if phi is quasi-conformal and this is holomorphic, etc., etc., et then this is so in such a situation, you can also put an invariant complex structure. And it's actually quite easy because you would put it here again, pull back. This would give you invariance of this one because by since, since the standard complex structure is invariant here because H is holomorphic, whatever you pull back here, it would be invariant on you because F is holomorphic. So notice that here, orbits stay in you forever. Huh? So this map is quasi-conformal on you, and orbits stay in you all the time. So these knots do not satisfy the first principle. But because the map here is of this form, where H is holomorphic, the complex structure that you put here remains invariant anyway. Okay? Because iterating n times here corresponds to going once, iterating n times there, and coming back. So really, you are only using your quasi-conformal map twice, not infinitely many times, okay? So if you had a situation like this, you would also be able to put 
put this complex structure and spread by the dynamics and you would be fine again. Okay? And instead of doing this in a proof, writing formulas and so on, I'm going to show you an example. So this is again a classical example of surgery. Okay? And it's one where we basically glue rotation domains in holes. So um, holes are usually found in many occasions, but in Hermann rings, right? If you have a Hermann ring, remember a Hermann ring is a set in dynamical plane <coughs> where the map is conformally conjugate to an irrational rotation. So a Hermann ring is something conformally equivalent to an analogous. And then there is a map that sends it to the conformal, to a true annulus. Here you have a rotation, uh, theta rotation, I mean z goes to e to the i theta z. And theta is an irrational number, right? So, yes, thank you very much. Um, so, this conjugates actually. Okay, so this is a diagram. If this is the ring, and this is your F, this phi is conjugating it to your annulus with the rotation of angle theta. So here inside the ring, you see all these invariant curves, which are the images under this conformal map. Can you put of, it down? Sorry? Move down. Move down. Yes. Thank you which are the images of the circles. These should be circles, huh? <laughs> This is a Hermann ring, while a single disk is exactly the same, just with a fixed point in the middle. Okay, so that this is all the same, but to the disk. So this is conformally equivalent to a disk, not to an anonymous. And these are the two types of rotation domains that can appear in holomorphic dynamics. And this surgery, what it does is to go from Hermann rings to single disks, and you could also reverse it and go from single disks to Hermann rings. And actually, this is only a particular case of a much more general surgery that simply glues rotation domains inside, inside quasi-circles with an irrational rotation. Okay, so this is only a particular case because everything is easier to do here than in the general setting. So, the idea is that Suppose you have a Hermann ring and let's take gamma, one of these invariant curves that I said here, so that you have a, an analytic conjugacy between, yeah, I'm missing the two pi here again. Well, it depends on what you want to call theta, but if it's irrational, yes. Well, if you want to write it in yes, 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 yes. I, I agree. <laughs> I agree. So um, I have this phi which is defined on the curve. In fact, it's defined on the neighborhood of the curve, and it's an analytic conjugacy to a rotation on the unit circle, right? And the idea is that I'm going to glue a single disk in this interior. Okay, so, um, in fact, I don't need this, because this is uh, all in analytic and everything. But anyway, so as long as this conjugate, so wait, let me do this first. Let's forget about this line for a second and let's look at what we want to do. So here is my gamma. Okay, this is the curve inside the ring. Then my my little phi sends is sends gamma to the unit circle and conjugates my F on gamma to the rigid rotation on the circle. Okay? In order to have a gluing map, I actually need a map on the whole interior of gamma. So what I want is, is to extend this little phi that was defined only on the boundary. I want to extend it to the whole disk, quasi conformally. Okay? This can be done, especially here because the map is analytic, but even if it was only quasi symmetric, it can already be done. Okay? This is this uh, Alfred's Berlin or to ID Earl extension that if you have a map that is quasi symmetric from a circle to a curve, you can extend to the interior quasi conformal. This is the gluing map. Okay, this is my gluing map because now what I do is to redefine my function in the inside to 
to redefine my function on the inside in order to glue this rotation. So I will go first by phi, then rotate, and then come back. This is a modification of my old map that leaves f as it was outside of gamma, but it glues this rotation in the inside, okay? Using this extension as the gluing map. This is exactly the situation we had in the Shishikura principle. <coughs> Because the rotation is obviously holomorphic. So, in such a situation, either I apply the principle or I see why this will work. Because if now I put the standard complex structure on the disk and I pull it back by, uh, by this file, quasi conformal, it will give me a field of ellipses in here, which by construction will be invariant under my new map. Because doing I didn't write it down, but doing uh, iterates here, it's like going by phi minus 1, iterating here, which it stays invariant and coming back. So it will be invariant here. Spreading by the dynamics will leave the dilatation and will leave it invariant on the whole plane. It has this complex structure has exactly the same di dilatation as the quasi conformal constant of, of the gluing map. So you are fine with all the conditions of the measurable river mapping theorem, so you can integrate. Here I haven't made a commutative diagram, I'm just, uh, but this is the part you should think of the diagram. So phi will conjugate my F tilde, my new map, to a holomorphic map downstairs. And you cannot see it very well, but what I tried to draw here is to keep the boundary. Somehow if this was inside a, 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 a Herman ring, now this will be inside a single disk somehow. Okay, so whatever you've done has to live inside a single disk because you've killed the whole. In particular, for example, let me tell you that if you map, so what you've done here is to fill in this part, right? So now your file has, is mapping and conjugating the two maps outside of your gamma curve, but is doing something different in the inside. It's replacing whatever dynamics you have here to simply rotating in the disk. Okay. So you fill in the hole, and um, for example, I don't know, many things can happen here. For example, you could go from a Mel, this doesn't matter if you are in a rational map, this is a local thing. If you were in a function, in a transcendental function with poles, for example, the Hermann rings need poles inside, you've killed the poles, so you are gone to an entire map, for example. Or you could do this on the outside. So for example, if your map was a transcendental map with a Hermann ring, and you glued this on the outside, you've killed the essential singularity, and you are in a Okay. So you really can play with this to go from functions of one type to functions of another type and even much more because you can do this surgery on the other way and you can play with this to put poles to, put, to go from certain families to others, etc. Okay. So um, depending on where you do this local surgery construction, you can use it to prove many different things in many different settings. Okay. So, these kind of constructions that I'm showing you are simply building blocks, okay, tools for whatever you need to do wherever you are. In particular here, let me say that um, if you start with a Blaschke product, right, of a Blaschke product, this, this Blaschke family with A is very important, three elements is important, but basically as long as this is a, uh, this is a rational map, with, a, with, a critical, with super attractive p fixed points at zero and infinity, right? I think it has a pole and, has a, uh, and the unit circle is invariant. And by adjusting the parameter, you could make it so that there is a Hermann ring around the unit circle. So if you do this procedure here, this is really the rational model that corresponds to the quadratic polynomials. So if you glue a single disk here, you will end up 
with a quadratic polynomial. Okay, in certain situations. And the same can be done in the transcendental world. So if you take the Arnold family of maps of the circle, this one that is uh, alpha plus beta sine of z, z plus alpha plus beta sine of z, so the perturbation of the rigid rotation with a sine function, and you complexify, you have something similar to the Blaschke family, but with essential singularities at zero and infinity. If you did this surgery in here, you would end up with a map of the form lambda z e to the z with a series. Okay. So this is what we call um, corresponding models, because these families are really corresponded somehow by this kind of surgery procedures. And this is used to transport features from one kind of family to the other. And this correspondence, in fact, has been used to prove many, many theorems about Siegel disks, boundaries of Siegel disks, critical points on the boundaries of Siegel disks, Jordan curve boundaries, because from this surgery, you can really squeeze it to get many, many information. Huh? Because this quasi-conformal uh, integrating map really maps one dynamical plane into the other. So wherever you had in one place, you inherit it careful of some regions to others. This is just a picture to show you, this is Christian's picture, uh, to show you, it's a pity that it cannot be seen very well, but this is the, precisely this is the Arnold family that I was talking to you. Here you have this Hermann ring, and when you glue the single disk inside, you are back to, you are moved here. Notice how you thinned out the Julia set somehow. And why is that? Because you've killed so many dynamics, right? You've killed a whole essential singularity. This has an essential singularity here and one at infinity. By gluing a single disk here, you've kind of simplified half of the dynamics of the map. Right? And that's why it looks much simpler. <coughs> OK, results proven with this tool, many. So um, this gluing, as I said, can be done even much more generally. Uh, it can also be reversed. Kishikura uh, did a, a lot of, of, of results with this, converting single disk into Hermann rings, just like uh, it's, it's actually nice. It's a pity I don't have time to do all of them, right? But if you take two spheres with two single disks, you could imagine these procedures as touching them and melting the two single disks together, right? The result is a new sphere, and it only has like a band around it that is your, your Hermann ring. Anyway, the thing is that you can prove, for example, that there are Hermann rings of any Bruno rotation number. For example, because a priori, single disks come from fixed points, but Hermann rings are something like ethereals. How do you find them, right? How do you construct them? What are they born from? No idea, right? Surgery shows you that as long as you have a single disk, you can have a Hermann ring of the same rotation number, because by the way, this procedure does not change the rotation number. Uh, also, the existence of critical points on the boundaries of rotation domains of certain maps, or Jordan curve boundaries, I already mentioned all this. OK, and last, the last principle I want to talk to you about is the mother of all principles. <laughs> because this is the only one that is really an even only Okay, this is Sullivan's principle already from 1981. Okay, and it, it just gives you a, a, now you will say, you could have started here and ignore the others, but no, I think each one has its, it gives you information, right? Anyway, this one just tells you that if you have a quasi-conformal, quasi sorry, if you have a quasi-regular map and you want to check whether it's a dynamical model for a holomorphic map, the only thing you have to do is to check that every iterate, so all iterates are uniformly quasi regular with the same k. Okay? So that uh, Fn, in the sense of composition, is k quasi conformal, and this k does not depend on the n that you have. Okay? It's more abstract because it's more powerful. Okay, so if all iterates are uniformly k quasi regular, then your function is QC conjugate to some holomorphic map. And I'm going to give you an incredibly fast and, and rough sketch of the proof of this. Okay? Here there is no geometry that, well, yes, there is a lot of geometry, 
But I mean, uh, this is much more general, and this could be, and that the, the invariant complex structure that we are going to build is more abstract. So one implication is very obvious. This one I will do precisely because it's just one. Like so if f is really quasi-conformally conjugate to a holomorphic map, and this phi is k quasi-conformal, since the iterates are phi f n phi minus one, right? F n is k quasi-conformal again, sorry, this one. So um, this thing is k squared quasi -conformal. So clearly in what direction is the same, is very easy. But now suppose that it's the other one. So suppose that you want, that you know that the iterates are KQC for all n. Then do the following. So the idea is, is this. And it's kind of magic that it works. Huh? It's the same, I, am I over time or? I'm oh, sorry, I thought, not yet. <laughs> so, the idea is the same idea that is used in many other groups when you try to build controversies. Right? So the idea is the following. You take f, z, you iterate n times. Here is fn of z. You put a circle in the tangent space at fn of z. And you now pull back, pull back by f star if you want to. Right? This will give you an ellipse here, an ellipse here, an ellipse here, an ellipse here. An ellipse here. So you define mu n of z, right, as this, as this fn star of mu zero, let's, let's notate it like this, so the standard complex structure located at fn of z. And now you do this for n, min, n plus one. So if you do this for n plus one, the circle will be here, so this one will already be an elite, an elite, an elite, an and you go n times by your map, and then n times by your pullback somehow, right? And this is your mu n. So this defines you a set of ellipses at your point z. Of course, you do this. You have a lot of things to check. You, you cannot do this at every point. You have to do it only when you are allowed, almost everywhere, almost everywhere, almost everywhere. But all these almost everywhere add up to one almost everywhere, and it's fine, OK? So you don't have to worry about that, or at least I will not worry in this rough sketch. Okay? So you do this kind of magic and you hope that this converges somewhere, and yes, it does. Okay? So um, you may interpret these ellipses right, as points on the unit disk somehow. So you may think of all the possible mu's at z, and by the way, these are all bounded by little k, right, because fn is uniform, k uniformly quasi-regular. So none of these complex numbers somehow will, will have models bigger than one. They will actually all have models less than something less than one. So these are uniform, it's a uniformly bounded set of points in your disk. And then you, you have to, you can do a lot of things, right? Well, let me just say that very roughly, as I said, Using that, um, this pullback is actually, if you think, this is a little complicated, yeah? but if you think that this pullback is actually an isometry in the hyperbolic metric, because if you take, if you use f star to move an, a, a point, an ellipse at f of z looked as a point on the disk to an ellipse here, and you look at this over z, you will. You will see, if you write this down, the formula of the pullback, you will see that this is actually a Mobius transformation. So this is really an isometry. And using this plus something else, you can actually see that this thing converges point-wise to a map, which is a measurable function. And this is your candidate to be invariant. But the way it's defined is this typical way that makes the result invariant whenever it converges. Yes. In general setting, it doesn't convert. You have to take the bias and Yes, yes, well, I, I, sorry. So this gives you a uniformly bounded set in the disk. And if you look at the bar center of this, OK, this moves continuously. And, and, and you can actually define like a point, somehow like a point wise Yes, I, I agree. But what is true is that just by definition, 
the result, if it exists, is invariant, right? Because of the way it's defined, notice that doing this one time more, right? So if you just go, if you try to look at one time more, would mean this is Fn plus 1 of z, right? So when I now pull back this one, right, this would be like taking f of z and defining me doing f star, so pulling back the result mu n at the point f of z. This is this equation that I've written here. So doing mu n plus 1 of z is doing f star of the ellipse that you had by mu n at the point f of z, which makes it Somehow this is the reason why this is actually invariant at the end, okay? It just means that, um, that the, the thing you constructed is really invariant under the pullback by f, and therefore you can do the rest, okay? Okay, so let me just finish by saying that all these constructions that we've seen, um, well, actually, Yes, all the two constructions that we've seen and many, many others are based or use heavily extension theorems. So these things that have nothing to do with dynamics but, they, but that they are extremely necessary when you do searching constructions in, in particular, right? Like uh, when can you extend uh, boundary maps to the interior or when can you extend interior maps to the boundary, right? This is something, as I say, that has nothing to do with dynamics, but that is essential in order to actually perform surgery on many occasions. Often, and in the examples that we've done, we only need to interpolate linearly, maybe, so it's very simple. In many occasions, this is really very simple to do, and you can actually do it explicitly wherever you need to do it. But in other cases, it's not so simple. And I'm not going to go into this, I just want to mention that this is an issue and that there are many extensions of these tablets, okay? I, I've just written two because those are the ones that we've used, and these two, you can do them as edge sizes, okay? So if you actually have um, standard angle line and you have boundary maps, so from the outer boundary to the outer boundary and from the inner boundary to the inner boundary, and let's suppose, I don't know what I've written here, but C1, you can actually prove as an exercise that this can be interpolated to a quasi-conformal map from the allolus bounded by the two first to the allolus bounded by the two second. This we used in one of the constructions. Or, right, if you have a if you have a diffeomorphism from the unit circle to the unit circle, you can actually extend it this YC1 to the interior, and therefore it will also be quasi-conformal. But let me say that these are well, these are the simple type because you ask for a lot of regularity on the boundary maps, but that there is a whole world here of how you could optimize what you ask the boundary maps to be, right? So you can think of here, in fact, for example, if you only need to have quasi-circles, you only need to have quasi-symmetric maps, etc., etc. So those are very powerful theorems uh, that are behind this and that they are one essential tool of surgery, okay? So this was just to mention. And to finish for the second time, let me say that surgery has had, different surgery uh, constructions have had a lot of successful stories. They are used to prove plenty of results of very different nature in very different contexts, right? So for example, in fact, they were introduced, motivated by the non-existence of wandering domains for rational maps, and they've been used to construct examples and counterexamples of dozens of conjectures and, and things. So, for example, as I already mentioned, that there are single disks and Hermann rings of any Bruno rotation number and other things. Uh, here is just a or for rotation numbers of bounded time showing that the boundaries are Jordan with critical points, at least for rational maps, or for the connectivity of Julia sets under certain hypotheses. So 
for example, from Newton's method, Shishikura used a very nice surgery construction to show that the Julia set is connected, and this has been extended to transcendental maps as well, without surgery. Um, to bound a number of non I'm realizing that Shishikura is in most of these <laughs> lines here. I mean, there are no authors, but if I have to write them with one S, I would have. No, there are many others. Huh? I mean, here is Hermans, Vianbeck, and Karsten. And, uh, I'm not going to do them all because I would not finish, but each of these has uh, a lot of people playing a role. Huh? Connectivity of the Julia set or bound on the number of non repelling cycles for a given system. Um, so, for example, to realize that a single disk requires a, somehow every single disk requires one critical point to accumulate on the boundary, and every Hermann rig requires two, so that one critical point cannot be serving two single disks at the same time. This is also a surgery construction. Um, parameterization of structurally stable components that I, that I already mentioned or constructing homeomorphisms between different parameter spaces because, as I said, this surgery many times allows you to go from one family of maps to another family of maps. So it really builds a map between the parameter space of one to the parameter space of the other. And you may wonder if this map is continuous or if it's injective or what is it doing, right? Or how, you, how it transports properties from one family to the other, etc. And a very, very, very large etc. that um, I don't know, I, I hope that you get the chance to, to look at whatever you're interested in. Um, and we leave the rest for tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Thank you.